So David Brooks, welcome. Kelly and oh. I both welcome you to the podcast. This is a double barrel of fun. I'm I'm it ready, is. ready, willing and able. Look out, well, mister. I'm really excited to talk to you about this. And I think it's something that interests Kelly a great deal too. Kelly, when you heard about David's book, um, how to know a person, the art of seeing others deeply and being deeply seen. What interested you about it? Well, I'm a little bit curious about David's journey because I once heard him say that in his house, the ethos was think Yiddish, act British. <laughs> and that I know you to be, you know, a journalist of the highest order and a specific kind of journalist, which is to say, not like Katie, whose job it is to ask questions, but rather someone who is supposed to summon an opinion and present it, which is sort of the opposite of what you're asking people to do in this book. So the, my deepest curiosity was how funny that you should come to this urgent message after a life of a somewhat aloof life where you could be in a cerebral space nine days out of 10 and not really have to operate on this level. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it that way, but uh, my whole life has been a journey to being more like Katie. Uh, and <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm totally cool with that, by the way. <laughs> you know, it's not I, a I, bad trajectory. Right, because I grew up, as you say, in a super intellectual world um, with my family. My parents were professors. And then when I got to be 18, the admissions officers at Columbia, Wesleyan and Brown decided I should go to the University of Chicago. Which was, <laughs> I laughed at that line, David. <laughs> also a super heady place. And a, I fit right in. My joke is I... Where fun goes to die, right? Right. And my, well, the best saying about Chicago, it's a, a Baptist school where atheist professors teach Jewish students St. Thomas Aquinas. So <laughs> super intellectual. And I fit right in. I My joke is I had a double major in history and celibacy while I was at Chicago. Uh, <laughs> uh, not and a so lot it, of connection. <laughs> not a lot of connection going on there. Um and so I, I was cerebral and it, you know, it, it worked for me. But at some point, you just want to get wise, right? <laughs> like smart people know about things, but wise people know about people. And, and, and life. And life and the circumstances we find ourselves in. And so, you know, wise people have a storehouse of knowledge about human nature. They're curious about other people. They're good at um, having conversations people remember for a long time. They're good at sitting with someone who's suffering. And so I just wanted to be more like that. I mean, one of the dualisms in the book is in every community, there are some people who are diminishers and some people who are illuminators. And diminishers make you feel small and unseen. They're not curious about you. They stereotype you. And illuminators light you up with their care. And they're just really good at making people feel seen, heard, and understood. And now I'm intimidated. I'm in the presence of two pretty good illuminators. So that's been my life journey to be well, like you guys. Interesting. You know, David, I mean, I have so much to talk to you about. I really enjoyed your book, and I think you're very funny in it. I like when you said when it comes to spontaneous displays of emotion, I had the emotional capacity of a head of cabbage. And <laughs> you you really talk about how sort of um, closed off you were to feelings, emotions, connections. And and it made me wonder, frankly, and and I think Kelly and I both I don't know. I'd love to hear about your childhood, Kelly. I have been always extremely empathetic and attuned to the emotional well-being of people around me to a point where it's a lot. You know, if I see someone by themselves, I always go and talk to them. When there was only one African-American girl in my piano group, I said to my teacher, I hope she wins the prize today because I felt that she felt lonely and different. So I've always been that way. And it made me wonder, is empathy the result of nurture or nature? Because your parents obviously were not particularly touchy-feely. But I feel like it's more than that. It's almost something you're hardwired to be. And I'm curious what you found out about that, David. Yeah, I think empathy is like, um, it's like athletic ability. Some people are born with more of it than others, but everybody needs training and everybody does better if they work on it. And so to me, empathy is three skills. Uh, one is caring, uh, or I'm sorry, the first is mirroring, and that's catching the emotion right in front of you. And that's the natural, you're comfortable with your body, 
you sense somebody else's emotions and you you share it, you feel it. That's mirroring. The next one is mentalizing. And that's the ability um, to see, oh, I had an experience like she's going through. So I sort of know what she's going through. So like on the first day of the job, I remember, oh, on my first day of the job, I was nervous. I was excited. I was overwhelmed. I had all these scattering of different emotions. So I'm mentalizing. I'm projecting what I think. And then the third thing is caring, the ability to accurately care. And so kids, like if you come home from work crying, your two-year-old will hand you a, a Band-Aid, which, which is sweet, but it's not what you want. Uh, so you have to effectively care. Uh, and so there's a, a guy named Rabbi Elliot Kukla who wrote about a woman who had a brain injury, so she fell on the floor. She, she just fell down sometimes. And she said, people are always rushing to lift me up because they're uncomfortable seeing an adult on the floor. Sometimes they just need to get down on the ground with me. And so empathy is knowing sometimes you just have to get down on the ground with someone. And I put in the book, I'm going to read it out a little empathy test so you can tell how naturally talented you are at empathy. And I'll read you a few statements and see if you agree with them. The first is, I find it hard to know what to do in social situations. It doesn't bother me when I show up late. People say I went too far in driving home my point. If those apply to you, you're probably you're naturally a little lower on empathy. On the other hand, interesting. Uh, here's some other statements. Interpersonal conflict is painful to me. I mimic the mannerisms of those around me. When I make a social blunder, I'm extremely disturbed. And so if you say yes, this sort of applies to me, that's a sign you probably have higher empathy. And so we, we have a, we're born with a certain level, but we all need training uh, to get better at it. I have two questions. One is, do you think that life experiences accelerate change? Like you had a really hard period in your life, your marriage fell apart and you did a little self-evaluation and didn't really like the results. Katie has obviously been through a terrible loss tw twice over, sister, husband. Uh, I had cancer in my 30s. It took two years to get rid of. So I wonder about those big moments. And then I want to drill down on mentalizing. But first, I'm curious. Do you think that it take if you are sort of uh, not a great empathizer by nature, do you think that an ordinary life can get you there or it takes something extraordinary? Well, we all, I have a pretty ordinary life, or really a blessed life, but I've had moments of suffering. I don't, I used to tell my kids, my students, you know, you can be knowledgeable with other people's knowledge, but you can't be wise with other people's wisdom that you have to live through it. And, you know, suffering, uh, one of my favorite sayings about suffering, it's from Paul Tillich, a 1950s theologian. He said, suffering Moments of suffering, phases of suffering, interrupt your life and remind you you're not the person you thought you were. And that he says they carve down through the basement of what you thought was the floor of your soul, and they carve through that and reveal a cavity below, and then they carve through that and reveal a cavity below. So you see, at least I think most people do, they see into depths of themselves they didn't know existed uh, in moments of suffering, and they know only spiritual and relational food will fill those depths. And so people have a choice, which is, they can be broken or broken open. And some people are broken. They get bitter. They get hard. They close in on themselves. But some people get more broken open and they feel more. They get more vulnerable. They have greater empathy. Uh, and I, I do think that when you, after you've been through suffering, you, you come out of it, if you use those horrible moments well, with a certain sort of knowledge. Uh, there's a phrase, a quotation I love from Thornton Wilder, which is, uh, Without your wound, where would your power be? It's your very remorse that makes your low voice tremble in the hearts of men. Uh, in love service, only wounded soldiers can serve. And so that that that's the knowledge. That Thornton people Wilder, come out. He, he could write that guy. Yeah, he had a <laughs> he nice was... twist of phrase, that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Before you talk about metalizing, though, I, I, I'm curious, David. So it seems to me this has been a lifelong, like something that you have, wanted to improve for some time or was it exacerbated by as kelly said a life event the the fact that your marriage didn't work out or was there was there an event or a series of events that really precipitated this longing and this search or is it just something that you felt was missing in your in your being yeah i i felt something was missing 
so frankly, in the, the story I tell in the book, I was I, I'm a big baseball fan, and I never, I all the big games I've gone to, I've never gotten a foul ball, and oh, yeah, I, 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 I so <laughs> this is that, a funny story. I I go to the a game in Baltimore with my youngest son, and the batter loses control of the bat, and it lands at my feet. It flies in the stands, and I've got a bat. And any normal human being would be jumping up and down, high-fiving, hugging everybody around me, <laughs> getting on the jumbotron. But I just put the bat at my feet and like sit there like inert, like a turtle. Uh, That's when I, you I, describe I, your <laughs> you having the emotional capacity of a head of cabbage. Yeah. So I'm like, <laughs> show a little joy, man. Um, and so that that's the aloof, reticent version of me. And I did it. I tried to improve myself or change the uh the university of chicago way i write books about it so i wrote a book about emotion then i wrote a book about uh, character formation then i wrote, wrote a book about suffering and this book is really about how to be wise about how, people and how to make them feel lit up and so that's you know i've you know work writers are usually working out their stuff in public uh and i'm working out my stuff and i'm trying to share what i learned with others one of my favorite phrases of writing is um we're beggars who tell other beggars where we found bread. Mm. And so when I find something that's useful, I share it. And that's like my highest satisfaction. And I'm, I'm going to name drop um, to show that I've made progress in life, which oh, I, I know uh, this story too. Yeah. So Oprah. Uh, Oprah. Yeah, so I, I was like, all right, so you're going to pull out the big O. <laughs> yeah. I was going to go yeah, with exactly. Katie Couric. Special to David. <laughs> <laughs> If you if you ladies want to praise me, I'm happy to put your story in place of the uh, Oprah okay. story. Uh -huh. <laughs> Go ahead, David. I, I didn't know I was going to walk into this amount of rivalry, but I'm fine. Uh -huh. with it. <laughs> Never, you know, just being honest. Ego's a thing, okay? <laughs> so Go the ahead, Oprah story. story. <laughs> now, I'm sorry, I missed it. Maybe I'll tell my Anne Hathaway story instead. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's funny too. I know, okay, we ahead. like that one. <laughs> Uh, so the Oprah story is that she interviews me two times, once in 2014 and once in 2019. And after 2019, after the taping, she pulls me aside and said, I've rarely seen someone change so much in middle age. You were so emotionally blocked before. So that was for me, that was like graduation day. <laughs> I can show that, you know, I, I've, I've made some progress in life. That is, I, I, all kidding aside, I think, I mean, obviously she's, so highly perceptive and intuitive just you know that goes without saying but um i think for her to recognize it and and did you feel obviously as you said you felt validated but do you think she was right i mean do you think there's a way you carry yourself differently that you talk to people differently that you your body language that everything about you has opened in some way i i think that's accurate i i do i i hope it's accurate. I'm still not all the way there. I'm not like the most, since I'm not a naturally gregarious person, as you know, but if, if you come up to me with a problem, I'm comfortable enough with your pain to sit with you in your pain a little more. Uh, and so I, I used to like freeze in fear because I didn't know what to do. And I've learned, you know, I've learned the hard way how to sit with someone traveling through depression. Uh, I've learned about how to sit with people who are grieving or even somebody who gets fired from a job or as they're feeling hurt in a social situation. Uh, and I've learned to storify life, to try to get stories. So there, there are two ways of thinking. There's the paradigmatic mode, which is making an argument, which is what we do if we're making a strategy memo or writing a newspaper column. And then there's the narrative mode, which is getting people to tell your stories. And so like, even in pol political journalism, I don't ask people, uh, what do you believe about this? I ask people, how did you come to believe this? And that way they're telling me about somebody who shaped their values or some experience they have there. We're in story mode. And, you know, I think. You know, I asked Sarah Palin that question, David, and she didn't have a very good answer. <laughs> That's true, right? <laughs> I said, what, what newspapers and magazines do you right? read? And I, actually, <laughs> honestly, I, I know all kidding aside, I was looking for some kind of deep answer that helped me understand what shaped her, what shaped her right. values, what shaped her outlook, her worldview. And, um, you know, it was an unsuccessful inquiry, but it's interesting because that's really, I was, I was genuinely curious about what leads someone to have a certain political ideology. You know, mm -hmm. I, it, you know, sometimes your parents, sometimes I thought she could say William F. Buckley or, 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 you know, honestly, even the Bible, 
I just was looking for what was a, a very formative experience that made her the woman she is today. Anyway, yeah. and, and it's, it's it's very curious that she couldn't answer that question well. Like, was she she, she genuinely lack a story about the values that formed her? Did she think, oh, I can't tell that in public? It it might not be helped me politically. Or maybe nobody had ever asked her. And so she didn't. A lot of people, no one's ever asked them those basic questions. Well, remember when Roger Mudd asked Teddy Kennedy why he wanted to be president and Teddy Kennedy was speechless? I was just thinking exactly of that episode. Yeah, exactly. I, I in it, for this book, I interviewed a guy named Dan McAdams who who gets people's life stories. He studies how people structure their life stories. And so he calls the research subjects in and he asks them over four hours, <clears throat> tell me about your high points, your low points, your turning points. And he says half the people cry at some point in the conversation. And then he gives them money to compensate them for their time. And a lot of the people just push back the check and say, I don't want this. This has been the best afternoon of my life. No one's ever asked me this story before. And I think a lot of people, and maybe this is the case of Sarah Perlin, no one asked her. She didn't She didn't have a formulated answer, uh, and I, which I imagine to be the case, unless she was hiding something, which I don't imagine to be the case. I think she just didn't read much and had no intellectual curiosity, honestly. And I think she yeah. got tripped up on naming things. And, and I kind of left it wide open. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's yeah. really interesting. Go ahead, Kelly. So I just wanted to loop back on mentalizing because what you were suggesting is that if a person comes through with a certain shape of a problem that you could identify and say, oh, I've had something similar. I, I know what that might feel like. But that bumps up against the UT research that you unearthed for the book, which is pointing us toward this terrible interpersonal arrogance where we have too much confidence in our ability to read body language and expression and gesture. And it brings up one of my all time favorite concepts. We did a series on it on my pod last year about intellectual humility. So can you talk about the UT research and what it points out about our over estimation of our own perception, perceptive skills. Yeah. First, I love that phrase, interpersonal arrogance. That's a, that's a, <laughs> that is what we are guilty <laughs> it of. It is yours. Take it. Thank you. I, it's, <laughs> it was, it was stolen about 30 seconds ago. Uh, <laughs> so the, the research is a guy named William Ickes, who's at the University of Texas, Arlington. Uh, and he, he finds that when we meet a stranger and have a conversation with them for the first time, we're accurately reading each other's minds only 20% of the time. And some people, when we are with friends and family, we are accurately reading each other 35% of the time. And so some people are pretty good at it. 55% they're accurate. Some people are terrible, 0%. And they think they're hundred percent. But the point is we're all sort of creative. We all have our own distinct point of view. We all see the world in our own way. And it's while it's important to mentalize, to try to think, well, I've shared this experience. You probably have too. Uh, we have to be humble and know we probably can't imagine our way into somebody else's mind. The only way in is asking. And that's why, to me, the, the central humanistic skill is the ability to be a great conversationalist. Uh, not just a good one, but a really great one. And this is another area where we're not as good as we think we are. <laughs> we all mm-hmm. think we're good conversationalists. But being a conversationalist, I mean, you guys do it for a living, but it's it's a high art form. Uh, and I've been in over the last year, I think back, I've been on some phenomenal conversations and I've been in some terrible ones that I don't really remember. And the phenomenal ones invariably re- revolved around some big question. Somebody put a big question on the table and it allowed us to explore it all together. I think about that, um, bringing intellectual humility into our most important relationships. So I have a 20 year old and a 22 year old, and I think think my job is to say, tell me more, what else, go on, until we unearth the thing behind the thing behind the thing. Because otherwise, they're presenting, and you're speeding to a point of view, and you're advising with your clever advice. And as soon as you start talking, they're tuning out. They're like, she literally doesn't even know what I'm talking about. I haven't even told her that the real reason I'm upset 
is because parents weekend is coming up and I don't know who we're having dinner with on Saturday night. But what I told her is I felt a little anxious in math class. And now she's talking to me about caffeine. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's fantastic. Like, That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I felt the rule is asked three times. Uh, like you, 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 your job is to stand in their standpoint uh, is to say, okay, what was that? And then ask it an, the same question, different phrasing. And then the third time, the third time you, you're actually beginning to get some answers. Uh, and the other thing that does is there's this book I quote in my book called Crucial Conversations, which is a great book. And they say in every conversation, uh, respect is like air. When it's present, nobody notices. And when it's absent, it's all anybody can think about. So if you're asking three times, you're honoring that person with like real care and attention. And, and you're showing respect. And, and that, that makes harder conversations uh, a little easier. In many ways, I think this book is a blueprint for everyone on how to be a better person, how to be a better partner, how to be a better friend, how to be a better parent. Um, and and I think I think everybody wants that. And and what do you think are some of the, you know, obviously we can't review the whole book, David, but what are some of the key things that you need to do to really know someone to make sure that person is really seen just parenthetically. I don't know about you all, but whenever I go to a funeral, I leave and I think, gosh, I wish I had known this person better. I never knew this. I never asked them about that. Um, a friend of mine recently died and I have to say, she believed nothing should be left unsaid. She always told me, we always told each other how important we were in, to each other in our lives. And she saw me and knew me deeply. And I think I knew her deeply too. I didn't have that feeling at her service. But so many other times I feel like, gosh, I had such a superficial relationship with this person. Why never, you know, why didn't I know them better? And I'm just curious, A, if you guys ever feel that way when you go to funerals. And again, B, David, what are some of the ways we can we can feel closer, more connected, and see people who are important to us? Yeah, I, I mean, I the nice thing about funerals is they talk about people talk about what matters. Uh, and when you, I had this earlier book where I made a distinction between the resume virtues and the eulogy virtues. Right, right, right. And, and the resume virtues are the things that make you good at your job. And nobody talks about that at a funeral. They talk about whether you're courageous, honest, capable of great love. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think, as I say, big questions are the way you get to know somebody. Like you're having coffee with someone, you're at a dinner table, whatever. And we're shy about asking questions. But there are some questions you can ask that lift people out of their day-to-day -day life and get them th seeing themselves from 30,000 feet. So it's like, what crossroads are you at? Often we're at a moment of transition life. It's interesting to ask, what crossroads are you at? Uh, I was at a dinner party and I asked people, how do your ancestors show up in your life? And it was sort of some ways a pretentious question. But, you know, there was a Dutch family. They talked about their Dutch heritage. There was a, a African-American couple. They talked about their African-American heritage. We got to know each other a lot well, better. And it was just fun. Uh, other questions are like, if this chapter, if, if this five years is a chapter in your life, what's the chapter about? <clears throat> and what's uh, what's the um, commitment you've made that you no longer really believe in? Uh, I was at a party with a political scientist. <clears throat> he said, I'm 80. What do I do with the rest of my life? And that was a great conversation about his interests or how you do old age well and what you should do in the years approaching death. And so we went on for like 90 minutes talking about wow. various things that spun off from that. And it's just like you think, oh, it's just a memorable conversation. But I'll never see him the same way. I, I I know a lot more about that guy. And I had the pleasure of really seeing into the interior of a very wise person's life. You know, it's, it would be fun to to do a game. I think they have this like conversation starters or totally. something. I don't know. I never, I've been given it and I've never used it, which may be <laughs> part of the problem, but maybe do a list of big questions that yeah. you can, that will open up a conversation. So Actually, when you're at a dinner party, it, 
it becomes much more meaningful and worth your time than a bunch of small talk with the person to your right. Yeah. I think it's almost like a, there's an awkwardness. You feel like a goon. Like we used to do those conversation cards and put one under each plate. And mm -hmm. then at any point during dinner, you could lift your plate and take the card and ask somebody next to you, like, what's your biggest fear? Or if your high school did superlatives, what would yours have been? Or if your mother wrote a book about you, what would it be called? <laughs> Is there anyone you would like to apologize to? Like there's so many juicy questions. And most people have like a little bit of a guard up and they feel goofy trying to take it from like, you know, the kid's soccer game or your Christmas plans to something much deeper. Well, David, so I think David cards... writes, Kelly, that that we're not taught how to do this. And I think that totally. therein lies and the, the rub, right? There's whole generations who think asking these types of questions is completely rude. Like my mother would say, oh, for God's sake, like, you know, you know how every now and then on Instagram or TikTok, it's like, ask your mother these seven questions before she dies. Like, I can't I even... sent that to my daughters recently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't even ask one question before my mom cut me off and said, oh, for God's sake, Kelly, who wants to talk about that? <laughs> so like, not everybody's playing the same game here. And not every generation is used to operating on this level. But we do have this million dollar opportunity where many, many more people have read many, many more of these types of books, have been to therapy, have sat on dorm room floors like bearing their soul. We're just more practiced in it. And hopefully it will lead to like a different kind of societal conversation, although it sure doesn't seem to be trending that way, David Brooks. Yeah, well, I do agree with you. And I, you know, obviously you got to pace it. <laughs> so you don't want to walk in and meet somebody, you know, how do your ancestors show up in your life? Like, hey. uh, <laughs> Hi, I'm like, David. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I start, you cried. <laughs> I, you know, I start just with um, like, uh, where'd you grow up? And I, I just want to get people talking about their childhood. People are fantastic totally. talking about their childhood. And so I, I travel a lot. So I've probably been to the place and we can have a conversation or even like, where'd you get your name? Like it's people talking about their family and stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, shallow conversations. Like I once asked a group of people, tell me about your most enjoyable, unimportant thing about yourself. Uh, and so I learned this austere academic guy. It loves trashy reality TV. So that was a, like a window into him. And I got to talk <laughs> about my obsession with early Taylor Swift's albums. Um, really? Wait, slow down, mister. <laughs> Give, your us list? Give us your a cheer lyric captain. or two. Yeah. Hey, hey, you're cheer. I'm, I'm on the bleachers. You're the cheer captain. <laughs> Did you relate? <laughs> Did you mentalize I, I, that? That's so, you know, I'm a, what's a, her lyric? Uh, I'm a, I'm your nightmare de dressed as a daydream. That's, <laughs> I, I, I so relate. I saw it. So oh me. my God. It <laughs> all goes Swift back David to Brooks Taylor Swift. Like, yeah. just let's stop the presses. We're breaking news. <laughs> David Brooks okay. is a Swifty. A good friend of mine okay. today said Taylor Swift isn't a singer. She's a lifestyle. Yeah. That's she's a religion true. at this point. She is. <laughs> she has a lyric that from her new album. Uh, let's see if I can remember it. That's uh, it's narcissism dressed up like altruism, like some sort of congressman. I think that's a fantastic lyric. It's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So, so I. He's brilliant. I, well, wait. I, so, I, so you're talking about um, interesting ways in to to get to know people, and I love it. And I think I, I Kelly, I imagine you and I probably do stuff like that because we are just naturally curious and interested and other people. Um, but I feel like you could always, I could always hone those skills even more. And to pick up on Ke Kelly's last point, David, I think, you know, when she said this, it, things aren't trending this way. Society is not making this easy. These deep connections, meaningful relationships. And you talk a lot about that. Um, how the way we live is almost antithetical to to creating these deep friendships where people feel seen. Can we, let's talk about that. Um, let's talk about, I, there's really interesting point you made later about young people getting politically active. And I wanna touch on that first, but can you talk about the things that are happening here and now that are really prohibiting what we're discussing? Yeah, I mean, that was in some ways the impetus by the book, not only my desire to personally grow, but looking at society around me. And we're in the middle of some sort of 
social and emotional and relational crisis. And so, you know, rising mental health problems, rising suicide rates, 54% of Americans say that no one knows them well. The number of people who say they have no close personal friends is up by four times in the last 20 years. Uh, that 36% of Americans say they feel persistently lonely. 45% of teenagers say they feel persistently hopeless and despondent. And so the number of people that in not in a romantic relationship is up by a third. It's just like one statistic after another, um, where we're just in an emotional and relational recession. Uh, and I think it's caused by this rising cycle of distrust. Uh, and distrust is caused because people haven't been trustworthy. People have, and especially young people, feel that others have betrayed them. And I used to talk about the levels of distrust with my students, my college students. And one woman said to me, well, have you seen our social life? Like you can imagine you go through life, you're getting ghosted by somebody you thought was your boyfriend or your girlfriend. You're getting savaged on social media. Uh, people are cruel to you. And so you have this rising level of distrust. And to me, the only way to fight it is with the skills I'm talking about in the book. And some people think like the stuff we're talking about is like woo woo and squishy. But to me, it's the only practical way out. Like, like it's not woo woo to like lead, learn, lead with curiosity. It's not woo woo to lead with respect. Uh, and the only way you get out of our social mess is by leading, by acting in this way. Can you talk about the, I guess you were giving a talk, David, and you got a question on an index card uh, that you said haunted you, has haunted you for a very long time. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I was in Oklahoma, and it's one of those talks where at the, at the end of the talk, they don't ask questions face-to-face. -face, they just give you index cards. So I'm running through the cards, uh, and uh, they, they, most of the questions are like politics or something. And then I open, turn to one card, and it says, what do you do if you no longer want to be alive? And that, to me, was like a window into a lot of the pain that's out there in America. And at the moment, I didn't know what to say. And so I let it go without even answering it or without even acknowledging it. Uh, and I think if I could go back, I would say, first of all, I want to salute you for, for your courage and your endurance because you are still here and you're in a lot of pain, but you're still here. And then I would like to repeat to you uh, something Viktor Frankl said in Man's Search for Meaning, which is that life has not stopped expecting things of you and that there are still many good things you can do in the world. And then I would say, and I, I mentioned, I have a chapter in the book about losing my um, oldest friend to depression. Uh, and, you know, I, I would say, listen, I'm, there's no words I can utter that can heal your pain. But I can assure you that we are here for, we're never leaving. We're here for you. And I, th I think when you're dealing with someone who's suffering from that much pain and depression, all you can say is, um, I acknowledge the reality of the situation. I'm here for you. I'm not leaving. I'm just here. When you told your described your embarrassment at a dinner the very next night, what happened? Yeah, the woman who was at our house for dinner said, "Well, my brother committed suicide uh, a few uh, months ago." And then I mentioned it. I have a my bunch of buddies, and I get on a Zoom call every Thursday, and I mentioned it to that group, and like half the people had some sort of suicide uh, in their family in their life, uh, and then. You know, as I mentioned a, a later, uh, my I lost my best friend to it. Uh, and it just feels like the pain in society is something pervasive that it, it, it's touched everyone who has lost someone to addiction, to suicide, uh, someone who has a kid who's suffering with mental health issues. It's just like rivers of pain in society. And I, it's hard to have a healthy s democracy when your society is rotting from the foundation. And this is what I worry about most, this, this social social fragmentation. I think about sometimes the increase in therapy and antidepressant medications and the decrease in mental health, like those two lines are not working together to take us to a better place. I think I wonder... David talks about that, Kelly, because he says um, looking within can lead people to become vulnerable narcissists. And I've wondered about that too, because when you look at surveys about happiness, it's really, and I, I've interviewed people about this, I'm sure all of us have, it's really about service to others and not being so self-absorbed and self-focused that leads you to happiness. And I thought 
you know, David, you could talk about what happened after World War II and how sort of the focus on the individual and now the uber focus on our own quote unquote well-being has impacted our ability to form deep relationships. Yeah, I mean, I think we've just got a much more individualistic culture. I mean, we when America was founded, the founding fathers had a pretty realistic view of human nature that we're, we're generous, but we're also self-centered. And so they had the idea that if we're going to build a country, a democracy out of these people, we need to do moral formation. And moral formation is a pretentious word, but it's really three basic things. One is it gives you tips for how to control your natural selfishness. Two, it helps you find a purpose in life, an ideal to organize your life around. And three, it teaches you the skills of being considerate in the complex circumstances of life. And so how do you sit with, some, how do you ask for an offer of forgiveness? Uh, you know, how do you break up with someone without crushing their heart? These are basic social skills. And I think we've uh, forgotten how to teach them, how to pass them on to generations. And then we just live in a much more individualistic culture where people decide, I don't need to pay attention to some external morality. I just need to get in touch with myself. And my basic rule is you're happier when you're thinking about other people and you're less happy when you're thinking about yourself. Uh, it's just like that simple. And a lot of our happiness industrial complex gets people thinking about themselves. Uh, and I think it's self-destructive. And, and there is research that shows that people who spend their most time thinking about happiness are least happy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, I know. so, um, and this so this is my take, mom's like whole opinion. So my dad sold ad space in women's magazines. And so we had women's magazines in our house going back to like McCall's and then good housekeeping and whatever. And she would look at them. And even though her whole life was being underwritten by these magazines, they drove her bananas because she hmm. was like, the answer is go to church and volunteer. That's the answer. <laughs> Like, yeah. what is all this nonsense? She sounds all like my mom. All this all this self-focus, all this me, 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 and I need a bath every day, and I need to have my massage, massager for my shoulders. She's like, that is nonsense. Like, get your ass in church and go help somebody. Well, I do yeah. think there's a happy medium. You know, I do think kind of, quote, unquote, self-care you know, the idea of putting your oxygen mask on first so you can be a better person to those you love. I do think there's some legitimacy to that, but I do think the pendulum has swung a little too far. And uh, I think it's honestly, I think it's kind of a, a, a modern day medicine for loneliness that if you can spend your time worrying about your pores, then, <laughs> then, it, then it's actually just taking time that um, it's it makes you feel better because you're thinking about something other than your own misery, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, it, it's, uh, it's just loneliness is a perversity because no one wants to be lonely. Uh, and yet now, as I said, 36% are persistently lonely. Why don't they just get together with the other lonely people? But one of the problems is loneliness distorts your view of reality. And it makes you suspicious of other people. So you begin to fear what you long for most, which is human connection. Uh, also, our, our sense of community has has unraveled, David. I know with the, your whole WEAVE pro project, you're looking at people who are developing kind of a sense of community. But you think about church attendance and religious services, the attendance has declined a lot. And there aren't like Rotary Clubs and Kiwanis Clubs and you know, people don't seem to get together as much. So these these things that that gave us a sense of community, of course, it was exacerbated by the pandemic. So I think bringing bringing some of those institutional structures back is really important too. Because you say, I, I'm curious. You say loneliness leads to meanness. So you know, it's not only distrust, but it's actually meanness. How so? Yeah. Well, if you feel uh, invisible to the world, there's nothing crueler than indifference. And so if you feel you're not seen by the world, you regard that as an injustice, which it is. And so you want to lash out. You you decide the world's a very dangerous place and you want to lash out. And I think what a lot of people have done is they've taken loneliness and they've taken really a moral vacuum they find themselves in and they've tried to fill it with politics. 
And so in a, in a healthy society, we have the politics of distribution, like where should we put the resources of money? How high should taxes be? What should we spend money on? That's a healthy society. We have the politics of recognition where we want to have a politics where my side uh, is elevated and respected and your side is shamed and destroyed. And so politics gives you the illusion that you are living in a moral landscape. There's us good guys and those bad guys. Gives you the illusion you're doing moral action. I'm getting indignant about those people who are ruining the country. It, it gives you the illusion of, of community, like you're in a, a party. But these are just illusions. Like you're not really in a community. You're not getting to know somebody. You're just hating the same people together. And you're not really in a moral landscape, which is about, you know, the, the line between good, evil, good and evil runs through every human heart, not between groups. And so you're, you're, you've traded your moral vacuum for sort of culture war and moral war. And I think that's one of the reasons why everything in society has gotten so politicized. Like but also so comedy. black and white and so right. lacking of nuance. You uh, quote a researcher named Ryan Streeter. He's director of domestic policy studies at the AEI American Enterprise Institute, that lonely young people are seven times more likely to say they are active in politics than young people who aren't lonely. And I think this is elaborating on what you just said. It gives them some sense of community to be with like-minded people. It's almost their little tribe of, of people who they can feel connected to. But what you're saying is they're not really connected to them. Yeah. They're just sharing Twitter, their Twitter feeds. And, you know, they're not really doing good. They're not sitting with the poor, serving a widow. They're just registering their feelings or their emotions about some political issue. And so to me, it's like a very impoverished way to live. I, you know, I cover politics. We care about politics. But politics is not more important than family politics is not not more important than your friendships and your relationships and when i look at the rise of misery in this country i i could tell a lot of stories like katie you told the sociology story we just don't aren't active in civic life i could tell the social media story uh which is you know social media is driving us all crazy which oh, I was also a true story i could tell economic inequality story we're just more separated from one another I can even tell the coddling story where over overprotective parenting leads to kids who are not resilient in the face of challenge. But to me, the core story and the one I address in the book is we're just not treating each other well. I mean, we, we just um, at the basic human level, we're uh, we're just a, a little. We find ourselves in worlds that distrustful and brutal, and the meanness comes up. You know, I was at a restaurant in New York a couple months ago and. I happened to be chatting with the owner and he said, I have to throw people out of this restaurant every week now for rude behavior. Um, I have a fr friend who's a nurse and she said, I have trouble keeping staff because the patients have gotten so abusive uh, that the nurses want to leave the profession. And so there's just been this rising tide of, of hate crimes, you know, the incidents on airplanes, COVID made it all worse, but loneliness leads to meanness. <laughs> yeah. And I accompaniment like in the Pope Francis way, is a very advanced move. Like for yeah. a human being to be able to do that, because accompaniment is sort of antithetical to the fix. What do you right. mean by accompaniment? It's just like, I'm just gonna sit with you. Like you can just tell me your weirdest, hardest thing. You can say, I think my marriage is ending. You can say, I don't have as much money as I pretend like I have. You can say, I think that my daughter is suicidal. You can say these horribly difficult things and I will not dive in with my smarty pants solution. I'll just sit with you. I'll just sit right down with you in it. But that is like very advanced. Like not that many people I know in my life are that good at biting their tongue because it's so uncomfortable. Yeah, I, I'm not. I always try to fix things for people. Yes, like or uh, offer solutions. That's my immediate impulse. How can I fix this problem for you? Yeah. And, and I that's, think you're tell right. me more, what else go on? Like those seven words will take you so far. And it's so relaxing to be like, I'm, I'm actually not formulating. We're not taking turns talking. I'm actually just absorbing. And I'm going to let you, like, I remember talking to Claire, my daughter during the pandemic. And she was such a, she was so bright eyed the whole time. She was baking and learning Spanish and like doing the pandemic, like getting an A in pandemic. And then she cracked one day. 
And I said, what else? And she said, lacrosse, like we can't play lacrosse, which means I'm not getting ex any exercise, which means like I'm sluggish all day. I'm like, what else? She's like, there are no parties. Like I just watched Fast Times at Ridgemont High. None of that is like my high school experience. My high school experience is sitting in my bedroom. What else? Go on. Everybody's fighting over who can go to parties and who can't. What else? I mean, she must have had 25 things. And all we did was let them surface. And I had no answers at all. It was just like, let the river run, Claire, like say it all. I don't care. I'm not going to stop you. We need to talk to Kelly more, David. I know. I know. <laughs> There's a thing uh, called the midwife model that your job in some conversations oh, when somebody's nice. hurting is that's your nice. job is not to be the, you're not giving birth. You're just the midwife. You're, you're helping the person give birth. Yeah. 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 Accompaniment is, is a, a, a noble aspiration person to person. I've never even heard of that. So I'm going to think about that. Yeah. And I it's think sort of, part a, of oh, go ahead, David. Yeah. I mean, it's like um, a pianist accompanying a singer, like the pianist is paying attention to the singer and he knows he's not the star, but he's doing what he can to make her shine. Yeah. You're like uh, coming up underneath. It's so yeah. beautiful. I wanted to ask you, I just, you know, everything you've talked about, of course, is surfacing in the aftermath of those horrific barbarian attacks in Israel that were just honestly so unspeak. I, I don't even, I think words fail to even describe what happened in Israel. And now, of course, the humanitarian crisis that is unfolding in Gaza, I think words fail there as well. But the reaction, David, has been so intense so um, angry, so lacking in humility, you know, that maybe you don't have all the answers. And I'm curious how you've seen that in light of writing this book and our frayed social relationships, how you've, how you've used your lens to, to watch this and analyze it. Yeah. So uh, thank you for asking that. It's obviously been a very intense period. Uh, I guess I first, I've sometimes have the thought that we're in this epic battle between the forces of dehumanization and the forces of humanization. And if you want to know dehumanization, the ultimate form is somebody who can go to a music festival and murder and rape innocent teenagers or young people. I mean, that is the essence of dehumanization. Uh, it's, like a, it's, it's like they were characters in a video game or yeah, something, so right? It's not. It's the, a failure to recognize the humanity of the people right in front of you and to cackle while you're killing them. Um, and then, frankly, I saw the Israeli defense minister say we're going to war against animals. And I think Hamas is evil, but they are human beings. <laughs> and we we just shouldn't call human beings animals. First of all, it's not fair to the animals. They're not going around committing genocide. Uh, but also it, it's just, we should always respect there's another human being on the side here. Well, and so more I'm, importantly is that Palestinians are, you know, Hamas doesn't represent all right. Palestinians. No, I mean, right. honestly, the way they behave and maybe this is wrong. I had no issue with him calling the people who committed these crimes animals yeah, uh, because they were subhuman to your point, David. But I think the mistake is tarring all Palestinians living in Gaza right. as such. Yeah. And some people, you know, you have to fight iron with iron. You have, you can't like reason with Hamas. Like you just have to fight them. And that's, that's the grim reality. But, you know, I was, I was late at night one night, I was doom scrolling through Twitter or whatever, whatever's left of it. Uh, and I was seeing all the videos of the kids who were killed in Israel, the bombings in Gaza, just ream of dehumanization. And then I scroll and somehow in my Twitter feed, there's I come across a video of a short interview with James Baldwin, the great novelist from the 50s and 60s. And he's saying there's not as much humanity in the world as one would like, but there's more than you think. There's enough. And you have to remember when you walk down the street and you look at the other people, you have to remember you're looking at you. That could be you. You could be the, the cop. You could be the monster. You could be the cruel person. And you just have to make a conscious choice to decide not to be that. And so in the midst of all this dehumanization, when you see Baldwin, you see a, a defiant humanist, uh, a, a person who's, who's not going to put away his humanity in the midst of conflict and the midst of racism, which is dehumanization. 
who's going to try to stand up for the human dignity and the human mind. And I just found that defiant humanism in the face of dehumanizing circumstances is so inspiring. It's like Mandela coming out of prison in South Africa. It's like gold in my ear in Israel in the Middle East. It's like Gandhi in India, like in brutal circumstances, discovering your humanity. And I'm a f big fan of a woman named Eddie Hillisum, who was a Jewish woman and grew up in Amsterdam in the 30s and 40s. And when the Nazis occupied Germany, at that point, she was 25 and frankly, self-indulgent and a little spoiled. But over the next few years, she was transformed into someone who was basically a human saint who spent her time caring for those other Jews in Amsterdam who were in danger of getting shipped to Auschwitz. And she was remembered as this warm, glowing, other-centered person. And her biographer wrote of her, she changed by paying attention. She paid close attention to the people who were suffering. And by power of that attention, she sort of grew by looking. Uh, and so she understood the anxiety in somebody's voice, the fear in somebody else's. And in that way, she was transformed. And I've always found her example of somebody who refused to get numb by bitterness and who insisted on being open and available and, and giving and accompanying people, uh, even in the most brutal times. I actually and think that goes to the single most important line in your book, which is that our greatest moral act is the quality of our attention. Yeah. You also and quote Peggy Peggy Noonan. Um, and, and I'm looking, oh, you said, you also quote Peggy Noonan saying people are proud of their bitterness now. Yeah. Uh, she, like, every, in every one of Peggy's columns, there are like three or four sentences you want to clip out and save forever. And yeah, that was, it's that true, was, isn't it? That but, was one but, of them. But, but it is depressing. And, you know, I have been chagrined that this whole idea of practicing dialectical thinking, holding two opposing views at once. Yes, the Israeli policies towards Gaza have been in some cases inhumane. And this attack was unconscionable and deserves universal condemnation. And and it just doesn't seem like people can can hold those two thoughts at once. Some people can. But they're even being accused of of being complicit if they're holding these two thoughts. And and for me as a journalist, honestly, it's been very, very difficult to cover this because I get angry DMs 24-7 from both sides. And um and and do you think there are people who who are able to try to look at to have empathy for both? places or is, are and those people in the minority we, could we potentially gin up some empathy for the people who are so drawn to certainty like could we say to to all the people in your dms of course you want it to be black and white of course you want it to be clear as day of course you want it to be unequivocal like we want that every time everything comes across our transom that's what we do. We're sorting as fast as we can, good or bad, good or bad, good or bad. But but and things so, are good or bad. I mean, I think course. you're talking about fact or fiction, but things are messy. They're right. nuanced. They're complicated. Totally. And 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 people are so righteous. Yes. Um, and you can understand that. And I want to be empathetic, as you say, Kelly, to those who are righteous, because I think they are bearing the burdens of uh the burden of you know, decades of of oppression or decades of fear, decades of anti-Semitism or decades of being thought you're less than because of your circumstances. So I get it. It's just so hard to navigate, David. Yeah. 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 You know, I, I covered it for 20 years or so. Uh, and it was the hardest thing to write about because people are so polarized about this issue. But I remember once I was at a dinner at when Shimon Peres was president of Israel. He had a dinner with like 40 or 50 people and he invited the Palestinian leadership was there. I remember Abu Allah, who was a lead Palestinian negotiator. And then the Israeli people who had been in the peace process for all their lives. There was a guy named Dan Meridor and others. And a bunch of journalists were invited. Uh, and there was such a warmth in the room <laughs> that 
it was as if everybody in the room was like a bunch of old guys who were in the peace process business. And they had been through crises. They'd been through years and decades of negotiation. And I remember that warmth. And there, this was back in the 90s when it really did seem like peace was at hand. Uh, and those were people who were just dealing with the complexities of the situation. Like, how do we have a settlement where the Palestinians get sovereignty over the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Jews get sovereignty over the Western Wall? Like, how, how do you do that? How practicalities of how you do it? Now, nobody's talking about practicalities, frankly. It's all theater. It's all terror theater. Uh, and people are just trying to get their message and their narrative across without just the elements of like how actually would you have a two-state solution uh, and i think what's happened is that both sides have given up on practical thinking they just are have decided well we'll postpone when we get but we're, we're going to get it all someday we're going to get it all we're going to wish that the other side didn't exist and that's just not true and the other side is going to be there forever and ever uh and yet we're, we're into just i want to make a statement on instagram and that's how i wage my politics these days and that's what wins. I mean, nobody, I have this scientist friend, Lisa Feldman Barrett, who I think you know, David. And yeah. um, she says, I never, uh, she's often quoted. She's like one of the top 1% of scientists quoted in other people's research, but she's never in the paper. And I said, why aren't you in the paper? And she said, because I won't say unequivocal things. And that's not mm -hmm. what anyone wants to hear. So the journalists hang up and they call another scientist who will say, oh yes, it's always this, or it's always that like black and white cells and nuance is exhausting. Yeah. Like vitriol is very energizing. Righteousness, you talk faster, you sit up higher, you draw people to you. It's like a total ego buzz. And like sitting around saying like, you know, this is really complicated. Like, what are you gonna do about it? Well, that? it's in en engagement through enragement, right? I mean, yes, that's exactly. the whole name of the game these days. You know, David, I, I could talk, Kelly and I, I think, could talk to you all day, but uh -huh. I'm, I'm curious as you look to the future, because I hate to say it, but I'm very pessimistic. I mean, I guess, you know, in terms of solving these issues and changing it on a ma macro level. So when all is said and done is the best thing you can say to people is change your life on a personal level that developing these bonds and these friendships will somehow bubble up and make the world a kinder, gentler place to paraphrase George Bush senior. I, well, you know, I think we need top down change. Like it's very hard to have a calm society when your political leaders are ripping it apart, ripping it to shreds from the top, but we also need bottom up. And when you look at moments in world history, when societies have really turned themselves around and there are, Examples of this, and Britain in the between 1830 and 1848. In 1830, it was like a totally screwed up society where alcoholism was rampant, domestic violence was rampant, uh, poverty and cruelty. And by 1848, it was you know it, it was suddenly no longer acceptable to get drunk and beat your wife the way it was acceptable 30 years before that. And so you had the beginnings of Victorian morality. And in this country, between 1890 and 1920 or so. We took a society that was pretty brutal, filled with economic uncertainty, uh, and we became a much more trusting society. And so you need top-down political change, like in the, our case, the progressive movement in the 1910s, but you also need bottom-up civic and relational change and cultural change. And so to me, you, you can't have a society at the top with democracy if you don't have trust at the bottom. And two generations ago, if you ask people, do you trust your neighbors? It's 60% say, yeah, people in my neighborhoods are pretty trustworthy. Now that's down to 30% and 19% of millennials and Gen Z. And so the only way to fix that is trustworthy behavior, uh, showing up for each other, having a sense that as I go through my life in the casual encounters of life at grocery store, at a coffee shop with somebody buying a cash register, there's a little hint of recognition with each other. And then better relationships with my neighbors, better still relationships with my close friends, and so I'm enmeshed in this dance, uh, this dance of people who are looking at me uh, and are hearing me in big ways and little ways. And then you begin to feel calm. Then you really can establish a trusting relationship. But it requires those minute daily interactions of life. Um, when I asked the barista, how are you? 
she says, I'm good. Thank you for asking. Yeah. I mean, it, it really only takes very simple interactions to, to have an open heart and to actually care in big ways, but small ways as well, you know, yeah. to smile at the person on the street or I don't know. I've always been that person. I don't know what it is about me, but I, I, I see part of my job is to make somebody's day a little bit better. And I sound like Shirley Temple right now. Yeah, right. Well, that's <laughs> no, why we love I, you, Katie. No, <laughs> but I around with you and you are making so many people happy. I mean, but the Kelly, way you, people... you too. And now David, you too. I think you're, it takes a little bit of effort. It takes a second, you know, and John gets mad at me sometimes when people occasionally approach me or they want a selfie or whatever. He says, exit question, exit questions, because <laughs> I do end up sort of hearing their life story in some cases. But I think- you know, if I can make someone happy or feel seen coming back to the book and and feel feel important, and they are, by the way, I, I I feel like that small amount of effort is so worth it. Plus, I don't want them telling my friend their friends I was a real bitch. <laughs> <laughs> They're sad as well. Isn't there? Isn't all there... altruism is self-serving, you see. That's right. <laughs> Taylor was right. It all goes back to Swift. Um <laughs> Isn't there uh, some great social science around the value of weak ties? Yeah, there is. Um, first, as Katie was talking, I when I was when my youngest son was nine, uh, people somebody came up to me on the street to say they like my work, whatever. And my son looks at me afterwards and said, "You know, they come for you, but they stay for me." <laughs> so that... <laughs> He's so right. He's so is right. he a stand-up? Uh, he so he wanted funny. to be at that age. He wanted to be a stand-up. Yeah, um, that's funny. That's but exactly. there is, yeah, the the strength of weak ties is like if you want a job or you want an opportunity, the people you know well know all the things you know, but the people you don't know well know things you don't know, yeah. and so it's it's those weak connections. And conversely, it, it, you were talking about being nice to the barista. If some if a somebody at a cash register is cruel to me or or aloof or cold and clearly pissed off at the world, it it dampens your day i mean it, these these yeah. minor interactions are weirdly powerful in shaping how you go through you know life sometimes i have to nudge myself to look someone right in the eyes hmm. like i just did it yesterday I'm, I'm taking this oil painting class and it was the last class and i wanted to thank the instructor and rather than like put a lot of words on it and do a big show i just made sure that i had her eyes you know, for two or three seconds. And I just said, thank you so much. I've loved this. And it was like a thing, like eye contact, <laughs> it, like real eye contact, eyeball to eyeball is more rare than I wish it was because it's way more impactful than a whole bunch of words. Well, I love this book and David, you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan. No, well, thank you, Katie. <laughs> and, I, and I always have been. I find your writing more often than not, like Peggy Noonan's, I, more than a phrase. I find the things you say really profound and um, really influence me in a positive way. So I would like to say thank you for, for all your writing. Thank you for being so vulnerable and honest about your desire to grow as a person, because I think all of us want that. Um, despite all the societal things that are swirling around us that are actually working against that. And, um, you know, all I can say is I'm going to try to see people even more because I think we can always do better at that. And uh, I think I'm also going to, I'm also going to focus on my really deep relationships, because I think for me, I have so many friends and so many acquaintances. And because I'm interested in everyone, sometimes I'm spread too thin and yeah. I can't be a good person, good friend to the people who really, really matter. So I think that's important too, because there just aren't enough hours in the day to have this kind of relationship with people. Yeah, that that danger of being spread too thin. I was just talking to my wife about this. Like, we have a friend who her marriage split up, and we learned about it a couple of weeks ago. And we like, you should break everything and like be there for her at that moment. But then we got this obligation, that obligation, 
And so it, it, I think we were, we were thinking, just have to be ruthless. Like whatever obligation we're going to have to break, we won't remember it, but we will remember being there for her at that moment. Um, so, and I will say it, it's a, it's just a, such a pleasure to be with you guys. You guys are the superstars of this skill I'm trying to learn. And Katie, what you just did there, like one way, I, one of the things I learned is how to end a conversation is you thank somebody for their time, but then you specify something you really appreciated that they told you. And then when, and then you say, thanks, it's been great to be with you. And when they end the conversation gracefully in that way, it's like they put a cherry on top. You feel you feel, oh, yeah, what they liked about me is when I said that interesting thing about or told that interesting story, you think, wow, that, well, that person's a great listener. So another discreet tip on how to end conversations gracefully. All right. So here's my ending for you. I, I was like going to say, I don't want it to end. Go ahead. Kelly. <laughs> I, I like that you've been willing to modulate in public. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I think that there's a real fear of people public figures saying I was wrong or I changed my mind and I think it's to the great detriment of society like people should change their mind as new information becomes available as new evidence surfaces we should adjust accordingly of course and for some reason it's sort of not done in, with public figures and the way that your feelings about your party the Republican Party have evolved over time for all of us to see, I think is a model for other people whose feelings might similarly be evolving over time. And it's essential that we set each other free in this way. Yeah, well, th so thank thanks. you for that. Thank you. You know, I, I, I've always thought politics is a competition between, between partial truths. That mm -hmm. in most issues, both sides have something right. Uh, and the, the key is to try to find the balance in that circumstance. And you never, I found you never want to be too, especially as a journalist, to be as too associated with one party or not. And so I was conservative. I was never really Republican because I, I didn't want to be part of a team because that like limits your thinking. And now one of my heroes is this guy, a philosopher, Isaiah Berlin. He said, I'm, I'm on the rightward edge of the leftward tendency. And so that's that, that's where I am these days. I'm on the right where it ends the left tendency. So happy to be there. Oh my God, a whole nother podcast uh, <laughs> about what what the hell is happening with the GOP, David. Yeah. But that'll have to be for your your next book or your next column because what a what a mess. Um, but we'll end on a happier note. Good luck with the book, David. I I really hope people will read it because I do think it'll improve their lives and. Are you doing a big book tour? Are you talking to a lot of people? How are you getting the word out? Yeah, I get to go on a tour of America. I tell my musician friends, imagine a rock tour with all the fun taken out. Uh, <laughs> and so it's like, I mean, the the fun part is I get to meet people and give talks and, you know, do signings. The unfun part is 6 a.m. flight to some new city every day. I remember one of my tours, I was on tour for 99 days. And I, at one point I connect, I counted, I was had 42 consecutive meals alone at an airport a hotel or, or an airplane and Oof. when you're like that you just get unmoored uh and i remember i saw a picture at that point of britney spears shaving her head and i was like <laughs> yeah yeah i could do that now i'm about at that psychological state where i don't think you really needed to at the time <laughs> yeah, right even. exactly yeah. exactly came pre-shaved <laughs> <laughs> thanks you ladies could pluck them you could pluck the last four. <laughs> oh, oh man Ouch, now, Kelly. All, all that Nice, she seems happy, so nice, know, David. <laughs> nice, happy talk about seeing and others. And I know. Really saying he really doesn't have much hair up <laughs> there. Really That's kind of surprising. Maybe it's just a Zoom. Maybe it's just a yeah. Zoom. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. And Kelly, what a treat to have you with me.